Amen. 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 It's good to be in church again. Amen. 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 So awesome to feel the presence of God today in this place. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, isn't God good? Amen. Amen. Uh, you can be seated for a few moments this morning. I'm not going to start off with a scripture this morning. Amen. Amen. When I began to prepare for this message, um, I didn't get nervous. I, I got I just felt concerned because what I'm going to be speaking about today um, is not easy um, to preach on or teach on or, or really because um, we'll get into a bit more, but I, I just got a bit nervous, not, not more, more concerned about it. Amen. Um, what I'm going to be talking about this morning or teaching on this morning, preaching on this morning, is something that's not talked a lot about in the church. I mean, kind of in general. And um, I think we need to do a lot more talking about it and teaching on it. Um, I'm thankful that our pastor did that a little while ago. He talked about spiritual warfare. And I think when we don't teach on something like spiritual warfare, or we don't talk about it enough, or teach on it, or preach on it, we do people a disservice. Um, because what happens is what things, things go on in their life, they don't understand what's happening, they don't know what's going on, and they get blindsided. Because it isn't talked a lot about. So I am going to be talking this morning about spiritual attacks. Seven signs of spiritual attacks. I think it's important in this day and age that we understand that. Uh, it's important in this day and age we know how to fight back. And I am thankful to our pastor who did teach on this a little while ago on spiritual warfare. Uh, me, myself, that's kind of the, something I, I really like. Um, I feel the devil's beat me up enough times. It's time to uh, turn the tables a bit. So, when it comes to spiritual attacks and understanding if you're in a spiritual attack at that time, is crucial to knowing it. You've got to recognize the warning signs of a spiritual attack. If you want to be able to survive. You have to recognize what's going on in your life. You have to recognize whether you're under attack, and what's going on in your life. And we're going to go into seven signs of a spiritual attack. And I think if we go through these signs and kind of explain them and look into them a little bit more, we're going to find that each one of us have gone through one of these things at least once in our life. And it's good to go over these signs, to go over them and figure out um, so we know what's going on. Amen. So there are seven signs, and then we're going to end off by kind of tying it all together with some spiritual warfare tips. Amen. So one of the worst, first things for us under a spiritual attack is you get a loss of spiritual desire. See, the goal of any spiritual attack is to turn you away from what God wants you to do. If you're in the will of God and you're trying to live for God and you're doing your best, the enemy wants to throw you off track. He wants to get in front of you and throw you and kind of turn you away. So the first warning sign you would find in your life is you find you just don't have that desire anymore. You just don't feel anything anymore. You just don't. I know we don't. We do. We should live by feeling alone. But our feelings do play a huge part in our life. Huge part. And uh, I, I know that I, I've been in that situation before. Where I just don't feel anything. 
And uh, you, you get to that point, and I, I don't know why I'm just going to be kind of, I'm just going to be transparent this morning before y'all, because what thing, one thing that I did one time is I didn't feel anything. Service in, service out. Nothing. And I got to the point where, I, where my feelings kicked it in and said, well, if you're not feeling anything, obviously God doesn't care anymore. And uh, what I did one day is I went to my house, and I was in my kitchen, and I turned some songs on. I was there alone, or the kids were upstairs or something. And I said, okay, God, this is it. This is it. If I'm going to pray now and feel nothing, if I'm going to sing these songs and feel nothing, if nothing's going to happen, then that's it, God, I'm done. I'm walking away. And when I began to get to that desperation of saying, I need some kind of something back, I need that again. When I got to that point in my kitchen there, the Holy Ghost just fell. And I, I had that, and all of a sudden I began to get back that spiritual desire again. I wanted to read the Word again. I wanted to pray again. I wanted to get back into church again. I wanted to get back to where I was again. But I had to get to that desperation point where God would say, How bad do you want it? But, but there's, we, but we have to get to that, we, we lose that spiritual desire at times though. There's also a difference between doing something out of obligation and doing something because you delighted or, or you want to do it. Amen. That's right. And then it can make it seem like an obligation to be at prayer. Yeah. Make it seem like an obligation to read your Bible. But when you get past that thinking it's not an obligation, but it's a privilege. I get to sit up in the mornings reading my Bible. I get to come here and pray. We have prayer at different times throughout the week. And um, yes. talk a little more about prayer in just a little while here. But, but you've got to get past that obligation point and think it's a privilege that I get to do this and I get to enjoy this type of lifestyle. Amen. Amen. But, that's, but that's the first step is that loss of spiritual desire, that loss of wanting to be in church. Second warning sign is that of physical fatigue. That doesn't sound spiritual, just being tired. But we are we have a body though. And we get tired. And we get worn out. And uh I know for myself uh working some night shifts. But I don't enjoy working night shifts, and I think John would agree with this, and others who work night shifts. Don't, I, don't, I don't enjoy them, but I do find that after a night shift, or well, even during a night shift sometimes, my thoughts just go sideways. And I'd be thinking, what in the world is going on here? Like, why am I doing that? But when you're, you're tired, and, it, and you, your body gets kind of weakened, and your body gets fatigued, it affects your spirit. It affects your spirit. And, and I find that and the enemy isn't any kind of gentleman to say, well, I'm going to ease up. They're tired. That's when, that's when he even intensifies it a bit more when you're tired. Or he can even give you the indication of feeling fatigued. When you, if he continually keeps on you, continually buffeting you, continually tempting you, and you're continually fighting back without having that opportunity to recharge, yeah. it fatigues you and it wears you out. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So there's times when we just get tired. Yeah. Time we just get tired of it. Amen. The third sign is when you lack attack. It seems like everything just, all your resources dry up. Everything stops at that point. You just, you lack any kind of attack. You're just, you begin to look more at your situation of what's going on around you. You begin to look at everything happening in your life and you take your eyes off Jesus and place them back on your problems. The enemy can make your problems seem insurmountable. 
he can cause you to worry about certain things. And when you begin to worry about something else other than if you worry about your problems, ultimately what you do is you become worshiping that problem. And all, all of a sudden, you're making decisions based on your feelings rather than on God's anointing to lead you. And so you base your, your decisions on feelings. Your feelings are going to betray you. Your feelings are going to lead you astray in different areas that you don't want to be going in. Yeah, that's true. Amen. So there's opportunities that come up. And you don't base these opportunities on what God wants you to do and what God's will is for your life. Amen. So there's time we just lack that attack back. That we just lack it. There are two times in our life when we're so vulnerable to temptation. It's when we have nothing and we have everything. We're so vulnerable when we have everything, even we have nothing. We're so vulnerable. At these times. So that's why during the good times and during the bad times, you have to stay close to God. You have to stay close to him. There, there, there isn't a time to go back and say, well, I'm just going to take a break from God for a while and go through. You don't have time for that. You've got to stay close at all times. Amen. I find especially during the bad times. My goodness, there's times... When you're going through it, and, and, and all you got, all you have to do is just say, "Oh, I, I got nothing else to do but just to hang on." Yeah. And the nice thing is about God is that when you can get a death grip on Him, and you begin to even that death grip you begin to slip, and you just can't hold it any longer because you, you're fighting this and fighting that, He's got a death grip on us. It's not us hanging on to him and him just kind of keep us at bay. It's him hanging on to us. Amen. Amen. So stay close to him. Stay close to him. Amen. Read the... Oh, get into a bit more. But stay close to God. Amen. Amen. Also, you'll find that if you're under spiritual attack, your prayer life is weak is weak uh, you just don't want to pray like Sister Teresa said this morning you just, you just don't want to I just, I just don't want to pray I just don't want to do that again and you get that weak prayer life and you begin to miss prayer on Sunday mornings and, and you begin to miss prayer on Monday nights and, and you're just not there for in your own personal prayer time is kind of a lost art. You just, you just don't want to get back into that place again. The enemy begins to throw everything else around you. You got this to deal with. You got this to deal with. Come on, you got, you want to get this done around the house. You want to go here and do this. You have to, you don't have time to pray today. And, uh, the enemy does that to us. Tries to throw us off track again. But he tries to get us to a place where we don't want to pray anymore. And if he can get, if he can get you not to pray. If he can get you to the place where you stop praying completely. You cease praying. You cease getting to that place where you're close to God. He can kind of run havoc. And if you're not praying, then don't sit there and wonder why all hell's breaking loose in your life. Come on. If you're not in there praying for yourself and going into your personal prayer closet and you find time to get close to God and you find time to pray and get that strength from Him, then don't wonder why everything's going wrong in your life. So I can tell you why it's going wrong. You're not praying. You're not taking that time. Jesus asked his disciples, he said, could you not watch with me one hour? No, that's not saying you have to pray for an hour every single time. But it means, could you not stay with me and pray for any time? Amen. 
I know for myself, there's been times I'm praying and I'm watching the clock. <laughs> Does this seem sufficient? Does this seem... Because I'm not, I'm not really into it at that time. But there have been times in my life where I've been praying and I couldn't care less what the time said. And you forget about the time. You forget about what's going on. And you forget about everything else. And God had a way of just blocking everything else out. And you just focus just on Him. Amen. But if the enemy can come along and block out God, yeah. amen, you're in danger. Matthew 26, verse 41 says, Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. You wonder why you keep falling into that same sin over and over and over and over again. You're not watching and praying. That's, I mean, it's, it's pretty black and white. This isn't a scripture we can say, well, let's break it down and, and, and dissect it because God has a hidden meaning behind all this. No, it, it's pretty simple. Watch and pray or else you're going to, be, you're, you're going to go into temptation. Amen. When you begin to pray, see, the, the enemy has laid out for your path all these different landmines and all these different traps and all these different things that try to trip you up and make you fall. And, and, and we go blindly along, walking right into these things. We walk into these mines, we fall into this trap, we fall into this and that and everything else. And, but when we pray, see, God goes before us. And leads us along. So instead of going in this direction, it's going to cause me to fall into sin again. He directs my path. And he leads me. And he directs my path. Because the word of God is lamping to my feet. So you can begin to see where you're going. And God leads you. And God guides you. But when you don't have that connection with God, you don't have that relationship closeness with God, God really can't lead you. That's right. Amen. He'll kind of walk beside us, hoping that we'll see he's there again and go to him when we fall to the same thing again and again. But sometimes he just walks beside us and just says, you know, I'm still here. I'm still here. Amen. And so our prayer life gets weakened. There's also times where we can become feeling overwhelmed and helpless. Does life feeling overwhelmed in your life? If you feel overwhelmed by life and just what's going on in your life, you could be under some kind of attack. To make you feel like everything is going wrong in your life. The word circumstance comes from two words. It means circum, which means encircle, and stance, which means to stand. So what circumstance means is you're encircled and standing, standing encircled by what's going on around you. And the enemy is so good at getting your eyes off, what you, off Jesus again and back onto your problems again. And, and it's this person's fault, and, and this person's doing this. And you begin to look around at everything going on around you. And uh, in, in the book, Screw Tape Letters, the one thing the enemy Screw Tape told his nephew Wormwood was to make his, well, the, he refers to the guy he's trying to tempt as the patient. And he tells him, make sure that everything, every problem he has is based upon his mother. It's true. He said, he said, make sure he, everything, he's, everything is based upon his mother. So he is overwhelmed by life because he's constantly concerned with how his mother bugs him. And it takes his eyes off the church again. But, takes his, but we get that way, though. Then because he says, you know, it's this person who's doing this to you. This person's doing this to you. This person's doing this. And look, at, look at your life who went in this direction. And you begin to look at all these things. You begin to get overwhelmed by it all. And when you get to that place where you're overwhelmed and you, you just can't see, you, you can't see a way out, long, it doesn't take long for that overwhelmness to feel 
hopelessness. This is hopeless. Can't get out of this situation. Can't get past all these circumstances that I'm facing. Can't get past all this stuff that's going on around my life. Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. That's the first part of the verse. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. When you lose hope, when you get to that place where you lose hope and hope doesn't seem to be around anymore, it gets to the point where you're pretty depressed if you don't have hope. And when you lose hope, hope then can affect your faith. Hebrews 11 one says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When you have hope in things, you can have faith in things. But those kind of things go hand in hand. The enemy can take away your hope. And if you can take your hope away and you feel hopeless, and it doesn't matter what you do, everything's going wrong in my life, I, you lose faith at that point. And you stop, and what happens when you stop, you stop living by faith. You start living by what's going on around your life again. And you base everything on your feelings again. Amen. I mean, so the enemy, if you can get you to lose hope, you can stop you to live by faith. Amen. And we've got to hang on to that faith. Amen. And we're going to talk a little bit about that a little while later. Next sign of a spiritual attack is that old iniquities come back. How you used to act or react in your BC prior to Christ, before Christ, how you used to act or react, all comes back. It all comes back. Iniquity is, is, is things that we have in our lifestyle. Amen. But our, our flesh just wants to go back to that lifestyle. It kind of liked the fact that it was in control and, it, and we just did what we wanted. And we, if, if it felt good, we did it. And, and, we, and we go back to that old lifestyle. And, and it happens and, uh, to us. We go through life and we think things are going great. And then all of a sudden a situation occurs in our life. And all of a sudden, wow, we just... Whatever. We think, wow, where in the world did that come from? Yeah. Where did that come from? You know, I thought I had that beat. Yeah. I thought I had that defeated. I thought I had that done with. But every so often, it just rears its head. Yeah. It's still there. And the enemy has a way of bringing that stuff up again. Right. See, he's, see, you don't understand is that the enemy has studied you. He studied you for a while. He knows what pushes your buttons. He knows what gets you going. He knows how to, how, how to throw you off track. He knows these kind of things. He knows how to do that kind of stuff. He's watched you go through life all this time, and he studied you. He studied thousands of others before you. So you got so to understand these things are in us, and we got to get rid of This can happen to us. Amen. But you've got to understand also that God's given you the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen. So when that old man kind of rears his head and you begin to lash out or you begin to go back to some sinful lifestyle, the Holy Ghost kicks in and says, hold on a second there. Just hold on. Stop right there. Hold on. Do you really want to go in this direction? Amen. God didn't leave us defenseless in all this. Amen. He gave us the conviction of the Holy Ghost. So when you do, someone God cuts you off in traffic, and you are tempted to do something, <laughs> and uh, yell and scream or whatever at them, you get that conviction that says, don't do that. Or you get the conviction that if you do happen to do it, the conviction comes along and says, you need to repent of that. And you can't have a place of finding a place of repentance and going before God and asking God to forgive you. 
Amen. But don't, don't walk past that conviction, though. Don't just kind of keep going past it and say, well, it's, it's, it's okay, it's okay. I'll just ignore it a bit longer. It, don't ignore the conviction you get. Amen. When these old habits and lifestyles begin to come back again. Also, you'll find that when you start uh, having some kind of attack in your life, you'll start f- pulling away from godly relationships. You'll prefer to fellowship with people who are not living for God. You'll, uh, you'll want to hang out with people who are not doing well, maybe in church. Um, let's say it this way. You want to hang out with people who are carnally minded and don't think properly. That's it. You begin to gravitate towards those people. And, and, and you one, and you just think, I just don't want to go to, I don't want to, I don't want to go to Tuesday night Bible study. I just don't want to. I don't want to be around anybody right now. And when you begin to have those thoughts, I just don't want to be around anybody in the church right now. I don't know. I don't know. Warning signs should be going off all around you yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you begin to have those thoughts that I don't want to be around anybody in the church. I'd rather go to my friend's house and, uh, and uh, even though they're not living right and they're doing this and that and the other thing, I'd rather be around them than people in the church. Yeah. So you begin, to, you begin to find yourself withdrawing from the church and pulling yourself out. You know, a uh, home group, well, no, I'm just not going to go to it anymore. I just don't feel like it's, nah. Monday night prayer, hmm, eh. It's just prayer. And these things, so we begin to pull ourselves away from these things. Amen. And you begin to prefer fellowship with anybody but godly people. Yeah. Amen. So those are, those are seven signs yeah. that maybe you're under some kind of attack. Seven signs that maybe you're, something's going on in your life that it's just not just you. Yeah. But we could just stop there and say, there you go. There's seven signs. Go home and figure it out. But we're not going to. Praise, praise God. Right? There is a way of getting out of all of these problems. <laughs> Amen. There is a way of breaking these chains. There's a way of breaking these attacks. There is a way that we're not weak, pathetic Christians who have to sit in the corner and say, well, I guess I'm under attack. Pray until the rapture. Sit here and pray until the rapture comes. And, and, and No. No, we're not... The church is never designed to do that. Amen. We're not just holding the fort down. <laughs> We're not. Amen. You ever talk about a mighty army? Amen. The church is powerful. Amen. So there's a few things that we can do to break the enemy's attack. There's things that are easy things to do. The first thing is, do not forget who made you. God created you. And God knew before you were born, this storm was going to come into your life. God knew before you were born, all these things were going to happen to you. And he equipped you and made you the way you are so you could deal with these things. Uh, With him. Amen. So don't forget, he made you. Amen. He's for you. He's not against you. Amen. Amen. So forget that. Amen. You're going to make it through him. Amen. You walk with him. He's going to get you through this situation, this difficulty, this trial, this storm, whatever you want to, whatever your word you want to use for it. He's going to get you through it. Amen. Don't forsake the time and place of prayer. Don't. Be at prayer. There's two things that have a successful prayer life. is a time of prayer. Find a time that works for you. If mornings don't work, don't make yourself get up at 4 or 5 in the morning to pray. 
Because if you're laying on the couch sleeping, you're not praying. Find a time that works good for you. And a place to pray. You know, if your house isn't... Find a place that works good for you to pray. Amen. It's vital that we pray. It's vital that we have that time with God. It's vital that we have Sunday morning prayer. We all come together here at the church is vital. Monday morning, Monday night prayer is vital. These are vital times. The church comes together and we begin to pray. There's times of corporate prayer and there's times of personal prayer. And corporate prayer is just as important as personal prayer. We need that time. Don't forsake it. Don't say, well, it's just... No, it's not just prayer. Amen. This is one of the most important times. Not only do you get time to pray, but you also get that time of fellowship again. Amen. So don't forsake the time and the place of prayer. Settle that kind of stuff in your mind. Don't forsake the place of power. It's the church. It's the church. Don't miss church. I don't think I can stress that enough. Don't miss church. Don't say, well, I'm just going to take a, a, a break here and, and I'll sit back in my lazy boy chair and uh, just for this Sunday. Come on. I, I can handle it. It's just a couple Sundays. I can handle it. You're going to find yourself in a whole world of hurt. I've often thought, you know, when you get those kind of thoughts, is the enemy is sitting on top of you and telling you, yeah, you got me beat. You got me beat. And he's got you by the throat. Yeah. Convincing the whole time, yeah, you got me beat. Uh-huh. You can, you, it's okay. You, you, you've got me beat. Amen. Amen. So come together as a church. Yes. Gather that strength from one another. Yes. Amen. Come to hear the preaching. Come to hear the teaching. Amen. This is, this is where we get, this is where we connect with each other. We connect with God. We get the Word of God taught to us. And that Word of God gets in our hearts and begins to change us and transform. This is where it all happens. Don't forsake it. Don't forsake the power of partnerships. What that means is get somebody in your life who you can talk to. Find an elder. Some may be harder to find an elder. But find somebody who's older than you maybe or or, or same age as you. Or find somebody you can talk to. Amen. You're going to find people who have lived a long time. You're going to find people who, yeah, generally people who have lived a long time have done more and seen more and experienced more than people who haven't. Brock put a thing on Facebook just the other day, something about if you're under the over the age of 25, um, then post something on here that you wish you knew when you were 25. And people were responding, I wish I knew this, I, you know, all these comments below. Because people get in wisdom and understand things in life. Yeah. So find somebody who can give you wise counsel. Yeah. Find people you can call. Somebody in the church. Or, uh, find somebody you can connect with. This is, this, this is vital to us. Yeah. Uh, People go through, uh, sometimes we go through life sometimes and we feel we, you know, well, we just got to just got to keep putting on the mask and we've got to be strong all the time. And, 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 but we've got to get to that place where we can talk to someone and say, listen, I'm just not doing great. I'm just not doing great. And know they're going to listen to you and not judge you and go run around the whole entire church and tell everybody, you know, so-and-so just said, know that they're not going to do that, but they're going to pray with you and they're going to help you get through the situation you're going through. And we've got to have that in the church. Yes. Amen. I, I, I think that's something that's almost, well, I, 
I think it's something that should be almost like in the organization. That we have these things that people we can call. Find, so f- I encourage you, find somebody. Find somebody you can talk to. Amen. And, and get some, it, it, just to have somebody you can bounce ideas off of who's going to listen to you. And, amen. 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 Also, this is probably the most important. Don't disconnect from pastoral protection. This, this is probably one of the biggest things is you stop coming to church and you, you stop listening to the preaching and you, and you stop listening to the times when you are counseled and you're, you ask questions about this and, and you, you're given counsel to do this. And you think, well, I don't think so. And, and all these different things. And, and, and you remove yourself from that. See, what you do is you remove yourself from that umbrella of protection. See, Pastor Nickel didn't just wake up one morning, get dressed and say, well, I'm going to start a church in Port Alberni. What do you think? And asked his wife, what do you think? Yeah, she says, yeah, pack up the kids, this car, let's go. And off they came. It wasn't just like that. But you got to understand, he's been called, chosen, ordained by God to be in this city, to pastor this church in this city. I mean, it wasn't just a happen chance thing. He happened to walk. It's all orchestrated by God. So you begin to kind of, kind of buck at that and kick at that and shut, shut it out and shut them down and, and, and don't want to listen anymore. You're, you're base, you're in a sense telling God, God, you made a mistake and you're wrong. Amen. So you, you take yourself out of that umbrella of protection. The pastor is the watchman in the tower. He's the watchman in the tower watching for what's coming down the road. And he sounds the alarm for your life because he sees you out there doing something you shouldn't be doing. And he sees the danger coming your way. And he yells at you to get out of the way and stop doing what you're doing. And you say, ah, what does he know? I don't see anything else around me. But he's seeing from a whole different vantage point than you are. He sees it from a whole different point of view than what you are seeing it from. So heed the advice. Uh, heed it. Listen to it. Amen. He's seeing things that's coming down the pipeline in your life. He doesn't just wake up at 2 in the morning because he wants to. (laughs) But there are times when he does wake up in the middle of the night and all of a sudden on his mind is you or me. And it's not just think, well, why am I thinking about that? Well, whatever. No, it's that nagging point. you got to get up. And pray about whatever. And as, as he begins to pray for you, thankfully he does pray for us. Amen. But does get up at those times and does pray. Right. Amen. Because you don't know what's going on. Maybe you don't even see it in your life. And you haven't even noticed it yet before. But also, God, but God the Holy Ghost has spoken to him and said, you need to pray for this person. You need to pray for this person. And as he begins to pray, God begins to open his eyes up to see more and more of what's going on in your life. And he gets up on Sunday morning begins to preach. You think, what is he doing? Is he preaching just at me? Because God shows him things. God gives him spiritual eyes to see things in your life. Amen. Amen. So don't, don't, don't disassociate from that or disconnect from that. Amen. Also, when you begin to call him Pastor Nickel, you're giving him authority to speak in your life. If not, just call him Ron. (laughs) I'm being being serious here, guys. I'm being serious. This is serious. But it's the truth. If you're going to call him Pastor, then let him Pastor. Boy. Boy. Amen. So don't shut them out. Don't shut them down. Amen. 
And don't wait till the point where the enemy's tearing you to pieces and you're, you're on your last breath before going to him and saying, can you help me out now? Now I'm down to the basically to the point where I'm, you know, I got nothing left in my life. Now can you help me? Don't wait till that point. Go to him before you get to that point and say, I'm going through a bit of a rough part, rough patch here. <laughs> to the point where you're almost to the point of out there, you know. But don't wait till that point. Don't wait till the enemy's tearing you to pieces before you go and say, I need some help. I need some counsel. I need, I need some answers. I, 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 just, I don't even know what I need, maybe. I just need you to just listen to how I'm going through. Just, can you just pray? Just, I don't know. Whatever it is. Amen. Amen. But, but don't disconnect from the pastor. Don't. Amen. Amen. He, he's, God's placed him here for you. The book of Jeremiah talks about, as I will give you pastors. After mine own heart, that past. So that's talk. That's from, that's the Old Testament talking to us today to give us pastors. And what they do is the Bible says they I think it's understanding and uh, I think it's. No, I don't have the scripture, but it's, it's we give them understanding and some, and uh, it's for guidance. That's what the pastor's for. Amen. Amen. So when you begin to understand again that, that it, it's ordained by God, and it's chosen by God, and, and God's placed him here as God's man of God in this church, Amen. it holds a whole different bit of light on the subject, I think. Amen. 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 Let's all stand.